Hey, I want to play this excerpt from this, uh, from this, uh, this, uh, this audio excerpt about uh, Ice Cube and the last time he saw Easy before he passed away. Give me the thumbs up button, guys, and subscribe to the Bri. We're gonna get into this interesting story. He said that I, he said that Easy didn't have a jacket on, and it was dead cold in New York. And the next, um, the next thing you know, he came back with pneumonia and then he died. Uh, anyway, let's check this out, y'all. That night at the tunnel, Easy and Cube spoke for hours. When the club closed, Easy was ill, prepared for the chilly New York weather. He couldn't catch a cab, so he simply walked off toward his hotel, shivering. Easy returned to Los Angeles with a bad cough. Easy was very sick. He didn't let on, but there were signs that he had begun to realize something was seriously wrong with him. In December 1994, after returning from New York, he recorded a track called The Motherfucking Real, featuring MC Ren and produced by DJ Yella, in which he speaks on his fate and legacy. When I die, niggas bury me. Make sure my shit reads easy motherfucking E. And it's a fact to be exact, my tombstone should read, he put Compton on that map. All I remember is him coughing a lot, MC Ren said, concerning the song's recording. I just thought he had a cold. Easy started to act like someone whose days were numbered. He hurriedly signed on publicist Phyllis Pollock to help promote the yet unrealized NWA project. And he got back in touch with Terry B., the white female rapper who'd released her debut on Ruthless in 1990. After seeing Ice-T perform with Body Count, Terry had felt the call of rock music and started a band called Manhole. But Easy wasn't with it, and her rock dreams remained in limbo, since she was still bound by the terms of her Ruthless deal. That is, until early 1995, when Easy called her out of the blue asking to meet up at the Del Amo Fashion Center in Torrance. He announced he was letting her out of her contract. That day was life-changing for me, because it allowed me to go on with my life, she said. It was almost like Easy was attempting to make amends. One important relationship, however, had hit a snag, Tamika Woods. Easy threw her out of the Topanga house, said Vince Caruso. Ruthless's college radio promoter. Rapper Stefan was in the midst of this squabble, he said, talking with Easy there about Stefan's album Trippin' with No Luggage. They were going upstairs when they ran into Woods coming down. Tamika's carrying her shit out, huffing and puffing. So I say, hey, Tamika. She don't say shit to me. He say, never mind her, cause she leaving. One day in mid-February, Easy began coughing violently and experiencing chest pains. He thought it might be an asthma attack, although he wasn't known to be asthmatic. His hulking bodyguards, the twins, phoned Mike Klein, who told them to take Easy to the hospital. They brought him to Norwalk Community Hospital's emergency room, where doctors elected to keep him overnight. A test determined that he had bronchitis, and Easy was sent home. None of this seemed unreasonable. Bronchitis runs in our family, said Easy's sister Patricia Wright. Easy soon returned to the studio, where he was to record a verse for his song with BG Knockout and Dresta called, called DPG Killer. Killer. Easy, Easy had hadn't yet recorded his part when he got to chatting with other people, thereby putting off an increasingly impatient BG. Eventually, he found Easy in a hallway, by himself sitting on the floor wheezing, like terribly. And I was like, you all right? BG said. He added that Easy was using some new huge yeah, ass inhalers, inhalers in, an in an attempt to control his breathing. Easy wasn't all right. He went, to the he went to the Topanga house to recover. At some point, Woods returned. But so did his symptoms, as bad as before. And on February 24th, he was taken to Cedar sinai Registered under an assumed name, he received a battery of tests, yielding a shocking result. Easy 
was HIV positive. He was on the phone crying and couldn't talk. And then the doctor got on the phone and asked me, Was I sitting down? Wood said. She too cried her eyes out, but was forced to quickly compose herself. She would need to come in and be tested as well. Woods was scared, and not just for Easy and herself. She was pregnant again, with their second child. Mm. That is crazy. Wow. Huh. I don't know, man. You know, it's been a lot of speculation about Matthew, Very White, Easy E, who was one of my favorite rappers growing up as a kid um, when they came out. Uh, I heard it was this. Uh, I think the rapper name is. Uh, I think his name was Toker, or I forgot the guy's name. It might have been Toker, but he did an interview with Vlad, one of Easy's artists. I believe his name is Toker, but he did a uh, interview with artists, with uh, an interview with Vlad, and he said that Easy would go and get alka alka puncture in his back, and I guess was you know he had very bad bronchitis, so he went to go get al um, alka puncture, and they think that he said he believes that they were using unsterilized needles. And that's where he might have gotten it from. The way, the, you know, the way that he might have gotten HIV. Uh, or he may have gotten some type of uh, infection that caused him to uh, diagnose him with HIV. But anyway, man, what do y'all think about this? It's pretty interesting, huh? Leave your comments. Give me the thumbs up button. And subscribe to the Green Eye. Appreciate it, guys. Hey everyone, and welcome to The Griot. Today's story is about when rapper Easy e met his wife, Tamika Wright. Let's go ahead and play this excerpt, y'all. It's pretty interesting. Hey, give me that thumbs up button. Thanks for watching The Griot. And subscribe. Tamika and Jerry. Tamika Woods met Easy e at an LA club in 1990. She wasn't an adoring fan. In fact, he had to talk her into a date. Just based off of image, I thought he would be kind of disrespectful, she said. But he impressed her with his manners and Matter. interesting conversation, Matter. and soon won her over. over. Like Easy, she hadn't had much handed uh -huh. to her in life, reportedly shuttling between parents and living for a time in a foster home. She raised a child as a single mother, and at a young age, young she age, was broke, she broke, posed broke, nude for a, magazine. for a magazine. I've had a Vanessa Williams experience, she said, but she worked to lift herself, attending a pair of L.A. community colleges, and in 1989, landed a job as secretary for Taboo Records' Clarence Avant, a music industry luminary who has worked closely with Quincy Jones and Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. Avant took over as Motown Records' chairman, in 1993, and Woods went with him. She's beautiful, and she's ruthless, and she's bright, said Avant. Woods and Easy vacationed in Hawaii and had a baby boy together. Easy moved her first into his Woodland Hills house and then into a Topanga home not far from Calabasas. Short and light-skinned, wearing ponytails and toting Gucci purses, she was smart and serious known to give as good as she got it. She laughed at him because he was afraid to open his sunroof on their first date. She wasn't his only woman, but perhaps owing to her music industry background, Wood seemed to have had his ear to an extent when it came to business matters. I could not reach Woods for comment for this book. I was indirectly doing things for Eric at the company, she said. Easy's ghostwriter, Dirty Red, who was close to him in this period, downplayed Woods' influence. Easy never told me me and Tamika are thinking about doing this or me and Tamika are thinking about doing that. Though he admitted, I don't know what their deal was behind closed doors. 
Some speculate it was she who helped drive a wedge between Easy and Jerry Heller, whose relationship began to disintegrate in late 1994. The NWA biopic Straight Outta Compton, for which she is credited as a producer, alongside Dre and Cube and others, portrays her going through company books and looking for evidence of Jerry's malfeasance. I think that toward the end of 1994, a lot of people were in Easy's ear. Jerry's doing this, and Jerry's doing that. He's charging you too much, and he's making more than you are, Heller said. Rapper Stefan said things were very awkward during this time, and that when Heller left the premises, Easy would scamper into his office and close the door. Jerry would be like, What's up with your little buddy? And I was like, I don't know. Heller's role at Ruthless was more than just that of a traditional artist manager. He'd also been an investor in the company, putting up his own money to get it running. While Heller has never been found liable for any financial improprieties at Ruthless, some people who were close to the situation came to believe he was stealing, alleging there existed a bank account he shared with Easy, and he was excessively drawing from it. What I was told from Easy, from his mouth, is that Jerry Heller put him $2 million into debt. And that's why he was done, said Dirty Red. BG Knockout recalled a time when Easy showed him company documents. He had records from where money was missing from the label. Millions of dollars that he said Jerry was stealing from him. And Jerry was sending him idle threats, faxes, and stuff like that. Crazy Bone also said Easy claimed Jerry was robbing him. Other insiders defend Heller. He never told me Jerry was stealing from him. He always told me he knew where his money was, said Easy's assistant, Sharice Henry. Jerry was always Easy E's protector, Toker told me, adding that Easy nonetheless blamed Jerry in part for Cube's and Dre's departures. Heller insists he didn't steal a dime. It's the most ridiculous allegation I've ever heard, he said. Around this time, Easy took on a new lawyer named Ron Sweeney, who was an acquaintance of Woods. Tracy Jernigan believes he and Woods worked to turn Easy against Jerry. Others point to the influence of Mike Klein, who'd been brought on to run security at Ruthless after Suge Knight's intimidations and was later promoted to director of business affairs. The way I saw it, Klein was wedging Jerry out of the picture, and Tamika was wedging Jerry out of the picture. Gary Ballin said. Sweeney did not respond to a request for comment, and multiple attempts to reach Klein for this book were unsuccessful. Whatever the case, in early 1995, after nearly eight years of partnership, Easy and Heller parted ways. The latter said he received a letter ending their relationship that February, but doesn't believe Easy was in his right mind when he wrote it. 